DC's Legends of Tomorrow is a show not quite like any other. I spoke on this channel before about how the show became the delightful oddity that it is, transforming from a simple superhero team-up spin-off to a wild and unpredictable adventure with its own unique identity. But there are several moments specifically in the show's run that really sum up everything that Legends can do or be, and I will die on the hill that these ridiculous ideas and displays aren't only good, they're kind of amazing. Because while Legends loves to lean into the absurdity as hard as possible at basically any given opportunity, it still remembers that a good story needs more to hold itself up. That it still needs a solid structure of some kind, and that real emotional beats still need to land in order for us to care and connect on a deeper level than simply enjoying the comedy. And when played correctly, these particular episodes manage to define the show by being both incredibly fun and effectively emotionally engaging. So how does Legends of Tomorrow deliver on both the comedy and the emotional weight? Why was a giant blue teddy bear one of the most triumphant moments of 2018, and how did it technically beat WandaVision to the punch? There will be plenty of spoilers to follow for DC's Legends of Tomorrow. While the show's second season was the first to start going in the direction that would define Legends, it was during season 3 where things really started to cement. As put by actor Nick Zano, who joined the cast at the start of season 2, in an interview with EW, when I got there they were coming off a season that had a vibe and tone that they were trying to change. That was very difficult. Nobody knew what was happening, what the agenda was, and what we were going to become. Season 2 was a transition year of saying, we are not the show, but grow with us because we're going somewhere. That somewhere would become very clear in Season 3, and the moment that truly defined what Legends of Tomorrow had now become occurred in the finale, an episode titled The Good, The Bad, and The Cuddly. It saw the Legends finally facing the big bad of the season, the monstrous time demon known as Malice by coming together to use the power of the six mystical totems of Zambezi. How do they use said totems to defeat a time demon? By Voltroning into a giant blue teddy bear named Bebo, and straight up kicking his ass. Bebo vs Malice wasn't the adorable plushie's first appearance in the series, having featured previously in the same season's ninth episode, appropriately titled Bebo the God of War. In this episode, the Kodomi Bebo doll was transported to the time of the Vikings, whilst in the possession of a younger version of the very recently departed legend Martin Stein and saw the local warriors accept the electronic bear as their new god. Bebo hungry. And our god hungers for battle! <laughs> Katie Lotz, the actor behind Legends captain Sarah Lance, said of Bebo's first appearance at Fan Expo Vancouver in 2018. That script was Legends' first kind of deep dive into craziness. <laughs> and I remember shooting that and we had all these Vikings and we're in this like, you know, amazing period here and everything's very like, ha uh -huh. And then you just see like Nate and Amaya having this blue fuzzy doll like sneaking in the background. And I remember we all turned and we were like, we just, did we jump the shark? And yet, Bebo was fully embraced by the audience becoming the perfect embodiment of what the series was coming to stand for. A silly but fun starting off point that gets the ball rolling without overly dominating the episode, with Bebo ultimately taking a backseat to the episode's emotional beats. That episode was the first to follow after Martin's death in that year's Arrowverse crossover, Crisis on Earth X, and would also see the departure of Martin's superhero partner, Jax. It was a novel way to deal with the death of a main character, not in wallowing in sadness but launching into something more fun, and then letting the relevant emotions play out naturally. The reappearance of Bebo came about surprisingly simply in the finale, as the legends are instructed to focus on something pure whilst trying to harness the power of the totems together, and Nate can't help but think of the purely innocent stuffed bear, accidentally making it the focus of their ritual. Wait, is somebody thinking of- I'm sorry, you said think of something pure and I thought- No, you didn't. Again, I said I'm sorry. Yeah, I can't stop thinking about him either. When discussing Bebo's surprise reappearance in the finale, Nate's actor Nick Zano told EW in 2019, I thought that was it. I was like, we were onto something and we just wrote a grenade into our own house. I was going to say, no way that this works or is believable in any sense. And I was a thousand percent wrong. So ever since then I always give it a grain of salt and trust the system. There's something up Bebo vs Malice that just works. As much as you could argue it shouldn't, that it was a step too far, just like the cast feared. But the setup and the overall structure of the episode makes it feel surprisingly natural. Despite opening with the death of the longtime character Rip Hunter as he sacrifices himself to hold off Malice, the overall episode still feels like a cathartic victory lap of the season's highlights, bringing back old villains only to kick their asses once more, and reuniting alongside old allies and friends like Helen of Troy, Jonah Hex, and Jax. Even redeemed villains Nora Dark and Kuasa get to fight alongside the legends for the first time, bringing everything nicely together. Not only is Bebo another highlight to come back to, it also serves as an emotional tether to Martin, 
It's not just some random toy. It's one clearly associated with that character thanks to the story told in Bebo the God of War. The Bebo in that episode was bought by the younger Martin for his daughter, a daughter whose own pregnancy and new parenthood had become the impetus for Martin to plan his retirement from the Legends, before willingly sacrificing himself to save the people he cared about. By the team literally becoming Bebo, it's visually recognising the character's influence on them still. A strange but somehow fitting tribute. Bebo was also the Legends very much cementing their own identity. Season 2 began the characters in the show itself on the path to becoming the weird outsiders, the misfits and the outcasts, and Season 3 doubled down in that direction and brought it into the text itself. The team spend the whole season dealing with being underestimated by both allies and villains, treated like the B-listers at best and the screw-ups at worst. So when they get to defeat the villain that no one else could, they get to do it in their own unique, absolutely triumphant way and embrace the crazy. Bebo want cuddles. <laughs> Bebo isn't a gag, it's an affirmation of identity. Coming off of the climatic showdown between Bebo and Malice, the question going into season 4 was where can they possibly go next? And the series tackled that question with gusto, featuring everything from a murderous unicorn, an evil fairy godmother, a giant kaiju, or a haunted killer puppet. It's easily the most outright wackiest season of Legends so far. I think I need a drink. And it ends on a sequence that is equally over the top as the triumph of Bebo in the episode Hayworld. After spending the season fighting off magical creatures released from hell and coming to realise their own hypocrisy and treating said creatures with fear instead of tolerance, the legends defeat the main antagonist Neron by convincing the world that these creatures aren't to be feared, ruining Neron's plan to magically harness the world's terror. But even as Neron's defeated, it comes at the cost of one of their own, though the situation is revealed to be not so hopeless thanks to an unexpected rendition of James Taylor's Sweet Baby James. There is a young cowboy who lives on the range. And the literal power of love that then brings the fallen Nate back to life. The setup is deeply silly, even by legend standard. And yet, the scene hits its emotional beats with unwavering confidence. As much of the situation is so cheesy, it's constructed in such a way that it manages to draw on the emotional arcs and thematic threads of the season as a whole to create something genuinely heartwarming and kind of beautiful. Dad, do you hear that? It's for you, son. The most vital thing is that the groundwork for that scene has been laid through the whole season, whether the viewer realised it or not. Like with Bebo, this kind of event can't just come out of nowhere. It needs setup and grounding so as not to feel totally tonally jarring. And Hayworld has that kind of groundwork in spades, down to the characters and the relationships involved, the literal aspect of singing and choice of song, and the overall themes at play, with every aspect having been set up in some way previously. It all hinges around a layered emotional core, primarily in paying off the complicated relationship between Nate and his father, and of Zari's development and overall character arc. Regarding Nate and his father, government boss Hank Haywood, their relationship at the beginning of the season is cold and emotionally distant. When the legends have to begin reporting to Hank, it only gets more challenging. Where Nate has embraced the chaos and freedom of the legends, Hank is deeply by the book and disapproves of the legends' methods. But over the course of the season, the two find common ground, especially when Hank joins the team on a mission to Paris 1927, where they naturally fight a minotaur alongside Ernest Hemingway, because of course they do. The big turning point in their relationship comes after Nate discovers that the minotaur can be lulled to sleep by music, and when Hank's attempts at doing things the proper way fail, he picks up a guitar and begins singing Sweet Baby James. There is a young cowboy who lives on the rain. What is happening? James Taylor, and it's good. And as the moon rises, he sits by his fire. Thinking about women and glasses of beer. The song becomes the emotional combination of Hank and Nate's relationship in that episode, about confronting their differing mindsets and attitudes. It's Hank's way of openly accepting his son for who he is. You did good, son. Oh, right back at you, Dad. I learned it from you, Nathaniel. Which makes it the perfect moment to then evoke in the finale, since Hank himself is eventually killed by Neron after choosing to stand by Nate in the Legends. Hank appropriately appears to Nate after his own death in Hayworld, to both comfort and guide him. This isn't the first time we've seen Hank as a ghost, appearing first in the episode Seance and Sensibility, and interacting with Constantine and Mick Rory, the latter of whom he possesses in order to confer with the legend's resident warlock. In Hayworld, after talking with Nate, Hank begins to sing the same song they previously connected over, 
and briefly possesses Mick once more in order to get everyone else involved. His horse and his cattle are his only companions. Importantly, Constantine is present for both of these moments, someone who can now connect the dots on behalf of the others. I think someone from beyond is trying to help us out. While Zarya is the first to join in the rendition after Hank, it's the Minotaur of all people who picks up a guitar and begins playing along, after having revealed earlier in the episode that all it wanted to do was play guitar. The other magical creatures, the so-called monsters, are the next to begin singing. While the legends are mourning, they watch these supposedly evil creatures singing for a fallen hero very much encapsulating the themes of the season as a whole, which, looking back, the first two episodes openly foreshadow. Visiting Woodstock in the premiere is literally a festival of love and tolerance, and then dealing with the witch hunt in Salem afterwards is an obvious lesson against fear and intolerance. So by the time we get to the finale, those opposing concepts are directly in conflict, as Neron attempts to spread fear, and the legends fight to do the opposite. Nestled amongst everything else, there's room for a short moment between Ava and Nora. Didn't they do this last year? Yes, we're part of the circle this time. This speaks volumes for both characters, how far they have come, and tying again still into that larger theme of the season. As characters that started out antagonistic towards the legends, with Nora herself having been a fully fledged villain, the previous season finale saw them on the sidelines looking in. This time around, not only tolerated, but accepted. But one of the biggest character moments in this finale belongs to Zari and ties back to her own musical number that occurred back in Seance and Sensibility. Wait a sec, is this a Bollywood musical number? You bet your ass it is. Zarya is a character from a dystopian future with a fairly dark history, and that episode used her encounter with a man possessing the powers of a love god to tackle some of the emotional baggage she's been carrying. I don't sing. Every day I find a way to shove my past and anger down. By diving headfirst into a Bollywood musical number, Seance and Sensibility gets to lean into the wonderful spectacle of the scene. But also address that Zarya is someone still struggling to lower her guard or to open up emotionally especially regarding the beginnings of her romance with Nate, and to help her turn a personal corner. I won't hide it, won't deny it, real love comes my way, I'll try it, I'll surrender. Zari's arc is a powerful part of what emotionally grounds sweet baby James in the finale. Normally closed off Zari being the first to sing as her openly embracing her feelings, especially her grief, rather than denying it as she's become so used to doing. He works in the saddle and sleeps in the canyon. And as powerful as her moment is, it comes with a consequence. By stopping Neron, Zari's future timeline is altered, and so by leaving the ship to try and save Nate, she willingly dooms herself to being paradox out of existence. It's a charged emotional climax to an otherwise fairy tale ending that does a lot to add even further depth to events and set up quite the sizable cliffhanger. Season 5's main balls to the walls moment comes not in the finale, which manages to be plenty crazy on its own thanks to Cisco's thong song somehow being a main feature. This thing right here is letting all the ladies know. <laughs> Check it out. But instead, in the penultimate episode of the season, the one where we're trapped on TV. Before WandaVision and raptured audiences with its story of superheroes trapped in a TV show, Legends already took its heroes and put them in a TV reality that lovingly skewered the likes of Friends, Downton Abbey, Star Trek, and Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. But like with the good, the bad, and the cuddly, and Hey World, putting the Legends in a TV world is about more than just the laughs, not only crushing the parodies themselves, but once again directly dealing with the thematic arcs of the season as a whole. The episode finds the Legends beaten by the villainous fates, and the world now under their authoritative, supposedly peaceful reign. Being forced to live their lives in the TV reality is both a punishment and a mercy from the villains, a way for reluctant fate and former legend Charlie to convince her power-hungry sisters to spare the team's lives. Each parody TV world is designed specifically to confront the emotional journeys that the various members of the team have been on throughout the season. For the Friends spoof, it's a world where Nuzari, Bayrad and Nate get to live together as the ultimate buds, where Bayrad is alive again, and Nate and Zari's complicated by the timeline history can be relegated to harmless, will they, won't they. Are you still upset about the time we almost kissed? I'm sorry. 
I'm sorry I missed the kiss. <laughs> High Castle Abbey gets to enjoy the sight of Constantine portrayed as a stiff upper lip butler. Lord and Lady Tarazi, may I present Lady Natalie and her daughter, Lady Astra. But also offers a world where his greatest regret has been undone. One where Astra gets her mother back and Constantine no longer has to live with his guilt. In Star Trip, Sarah and Ava get to live in reality where they get to keep doing what they love without ever losing. And so also never have to deal with losing a crewmate or friend again. No! There's no need to vocalize at that decibel. They're androids. Air. Air. Oh, right. Each of these realities is built directly off of a scene in a previous episode where the legends discuss what their temptations would be if they were to use the MacGuffin of the season, the Loom of Fate, and are intended to be seen as a gift rather than a prison by Charlie. These temptations made manifest is brought to the forefront during Mr. Parker's cul-de-sac, with the cheerfully ominous music number, Repress. Repress, repress, I'll go back and repress. It's better to bury my feelings. That drives home the pain the legends have suffered in the real world, and one by one sends them back to their TV prisons. Unlike something like Sweet Baby James, Repress goes from faux upbeat and cheerful to something much more unsettling and harrowing by the time Astra and Constantine seemingly accept their new reality. Repress, repress, I'll go back and repress. The season as a whole revolves around stopping the fates from using the loom of fate to control reality for what they perceive to be the better, tackling the idea of free will and whether it's worth the resulting suffering and chaos, or if it's better to live an obedient life of structure and security. In a lot of ways, it's the perfect theme to tackle for a show that only came into its own once it went off in its own unique way, a natural evolution of the type of stories Legends has been telling for years. And the idea behind the one where we're trapped on TV is the perfect way to address this concept. In the TV world, reality is scripted, clean, easy. The legends don't have to feel any pain or regret, whether it's Sarah dealing with Oliver Queen's death in Crisis of Infinite Earths, or Nate with losing the original Zari, Zari 2.0 losing her brother Bayrod, or Astra hating Constantine for failing her family. But Legends has always been about embracing the chaos for the better, and one by one the team comes to accept that reality without free will isn't one they consider worth living in. If a life is beautiful and terrible, all at the same time, but if we're only living part of it, then we're not living at all. The fates believe free will has led humanity astray, where our heroes instead see it as something worth fighting for. And it all comes down to having a choice. A choice the legends make by breaking free of their prisons in a series of moments just as triumphant as Bebo, and just as personal as the climax of Hayworld. Stop being so obedient. Get off your couches and take control of your lives. Legends of Tomorrow became its best self when it started fully thriving within disaster, but it still manages to remember that absurdity works best when it's grounded in something real as well. You can have episodes that push the creative boundaries as far as they can, whether it's with a Bollywood musical number, a bottled episode with an emotional support hellhound, or with puppets, so many puppets, while still making the audience feel something. By tying the emotional arcs of the characters to these kinds of stories, it gives the chaos something tangible to connect to. Bebo feels triumphant because he represents the struggles of the heroes to claim their own identity. A rendition of Sweet Baby James tugs at the heartstrings by focusing on their relationships, specifically between Nate, his father, and Zari. And a variety of pitch-perfect TV spoofs grounds itself by confronting what the team thinks they want from their lives. It's this balance that makes Legend something much more than the show it started as, something that can not only make you laugh, but also make you care. Cast member Dominic Purcell summed up the beautiful paradox of Legends when discussing the great Bebo moment with EW in 2019. I remember exactly what I said. Okay, this is a career ender. This is the end of my career for sure. I mean, seriously, that's what I thought. Okay, I'm never coming back from this. But again, in time, that kind of stuff belongs on Legends, and we are allowed to basically do whatever we want. That's the beauty of this show. Thanks for watching. What's been your favorite example of the Legends going full chaotic? What kind of absurdity would you like to see the team tackle in the future? and just how much Bebo should it involve. Check out season six of Legends of Tomorrow airing now. Comment down below what you think, and please consider hitting those like and subscribe buttons if you want to keep up to date with what I'm talking about next. Thanks again, and see you later.